Tonight, Gaza's plight. The UN and other global agencies continue to decry Israel's endless onslaught into the West Bank as humanitarian aid struggles to make its way to the masses. Moscow's martyrs. Russia serves sentences to the ruthless perpetrators of the tragic Moscow attacks, with thousands mourning the loss of loved ones in one of the deadliest attacks in the country. Trump's troubles. Time's up for Trump tonight with his historically huge bond on the table. With the deadline looming, it remains to be seen which will go first, his money or his property. And car crazy. A certain collector showcases his love for Hot Wheels with his lifelong collection on full display. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. It's Monday and you're joining us on World News this pleasant night. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us this evening as we kick off the start of what will hopefully become nothing but a successful and productive week. Well, we here at World News kept up to date with stories that continue to develop over the weekend and we're starting off with updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Air and artillery strikes pounded targets in Gaza yesterday as UN Chief Antonio Guterres called for a surge of aid into the besieged territory he said was stalked by horror and starvation. In Rafah, the night was interrupted again by airstrikes that destroyed residential buildings. This border city is the place where Israel had told Palestinians to find refuge. More than one million people came here. Hassan Zanun and his family were sleeping when their building collapsed. On Sunday again, families mourned their loved ones in this Rafa hospital, caressing their body bags one last time. Israel says it's hoping to destroy Hamas's military capabilities to avert new attacks against its territory to press for the release of the hostages. But survivors say civilians are the ones getting killed. After visiting the Egyptian side of the Gaza border, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called again to stop the violence, urging world powers to act at once. Nothing justifies the abhorrent October 7 Hamas attacks on and hostage taking in Israel. But nothing justifies the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. The Security Council will examine a new resolution on a ceasefire on Monday after previous ones were blocked by vetoes. If this one passes, pressure would increase on Israel to suspend its strikes. And now an update on the tragedy in Russia as the country lowered flags to half-mast for a day of mourning and charged four men that it accused of gunning down scores of people at a concert outside Moscow in the deadliest attack inside Russia for two decades. A Moscow court said that the four suspects charged with acts of terrorism would be remanded in pretrial custody until late May, adding that the three of the four had pleaded guilty to all charges. For more on this story, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the latest? Yes, Anuradi. Earlier in the day, Russia lowered flags to half-mast for a day of mourning and people continued to lay flowers in memory of those killed. The death toll has risen to well over a hundred, with even more still in the hospital and some in serious conditions. The Islamic militant group, Islamic State, has claimed responsibility and has released the footage of the attack. And Putin who has not yet publicly mentioned Islamic State in connection with the attack, say that some on the Ukrainian side had been prepared to spirit the gunmen across the border. Ukraine has denied any role in this attack. The White House said the US government shared information with Russia earlier this month about a planned attack in Moscow and had issued a public advisory to Americans in Russia. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. 
And now on to India's struggle with democracy. Dozens of members of the opposition Aam Admi Party were detained in New Delhi and sporadic protests erupted elsewhere across India against the arrest of the AAP's top leader for graft just weeks before the general election. The Aad Admi Party members were detained on Friday after protests erupted across India against the arrest of the AAP's top leader. Arvind Kejriwal was detained on Thursday by India's Financial Crime Agency in connection with corruption allegations relating to the city's liquor policy. The AAP, which rules Delhi and the nearby state of Punjab, has dismissed the allegations against him and says that it is a politically motivated smear campaign. The latest wave of detentions and protests have erupted just weeks before a general election starts on April the 19th. Kejriwal's arrest is a setback for the larger opposition alliance he heads, which aims to challenge the ruling BJP and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. All the main leaders of his decade-old party are now in jail in connection with the liquor case. India's main financial crime-fighting agency has investigated well over 100 opposition politicians in the past decade. Drawing criticism, it has become a weapon used by Modi and his party to cull political opponents. While India's opposition has been struggling to close the wide gap in opinion polls with Modi in the run-up to the election, they maintain the arrests are politically motivated. They have accused Modi of seeking to squeeze and weaken the opposition ahead of the election, which will run between April and June. The federal government and the BJP deny political interference and say law enforcement agencies are doing their job. We are back on the topic of the Russia-Ukraine conflict now. Ukraine says that it has hit two landing ships, a communications center and other infrastructure used by Russia's backslave fleet of annex Crimea. An announcement by the Ukrainian general staff said the Yamal and Azov ships have been destroyed. For more on this story, we have other than the world news special correspondent Shanika Dharmaratna from Vietbesk, Belarus. Shanika? Yes, Anradi. The Russian installed governor of the port of Sevastopol said 10 Ukrainian missiles had been shot down. Russia also launched a missile and a drone attack on the capital Kyiv and the region of Lviv. Kyiv residents took shelter in the metro station as the attack began. Officials said their defenses had shot down 18 Russian missiles and 25 drones there. There was only minor damage. About 20 Russian missiles and seven drones targeted critical infrastructure in the western region of Lviv. No damage has been reported. One of the cruise missiles entered the airspace of neighboring Poland, a NATO member, the armed forces announced. There has been an increase in the aerial attacks by both sides in the past few days, even as Russia makes slow progress in taking some territory in the east of the country. Recently, Russia fired dozens of missiles at Ukraine, hitting a dam and leaving million Ukrainian without power. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Shanuka Dharmaratna from Vietbesk in Belarus. We have some more board attentions over in the South China Sea tonight. China's Coast Guard fired water cannons at Philippine ships in disputed waters of the South China Sea. Actions the Philippines called irresponsible and provocative. Video released by the Philippines shows a civilian supply vessel being doused by water cannons, which the country's task force on the South China Sea said caused significant damage and injury to personnel on the boat. The civilian vessel was hired to resupply a small number of Filipino troops stationed on a grounded ship the Philippines uses to reinforce its sovereignty claims. It was being escorted by two Navy ships and two Coast Guard vessels, the Philippine military said. The Philippine Coast Guard said one of its Coast Guard vessels was also impeded and encircled by a Chinese Coast Guard ship and two Chinese maritime militia vessels. China claims almost the entire South China Sea, including the Second Thomas Shoal, which is within the Philippines' 200-mile exclusive economic zone. A 2016 ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration found that China's sweeping claims have no legal basis. China's Coast Guard said the Philippine vessels ignored repeated warnings and forced their way in. It says all responsibility for the incident lies with the Philippines. The Philippines' South China Sea Task Force said the country will not be deterred by veiled threats or hostility from exercising its legal rights over its maritime zones.
Let's go for a short commercial break. Stay tuned for more key global updates. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We join you again with some updates on Trump's legal troubles. The time goes tick-tock for Trump tonight on his massive bond payment. Trump's lawyers filed a motion telling the court that he does not have the funds. New York Attorney General Letitia Gaines said that she will ask the court to seize his assets if he does not pay. Tonight, former President Donald Trump on the brink of possible financial peril. We have a great company, but they want to take it away. He has just hours left to find more than $450 million in cash to post an appeal bond in New York before Monday's judge-ordered deadline. And if he fails to do that, New York Attorney General Letitia James can begin seizing his major properties and other assets. It's all politics. Trump claims the money is not an issue even posting on his social media account that he has nearly $500 million in cash on hand. But in court, his lawyers are making a different claim, filing a motion earlier this week to delay him having to post the bond by tomorrow, saying he did not have the necessary cash. In that motion, they wrote that the current bond demand is a practical impossibility and that 30 insurance companies had already rejected his terms. To avoid the AG from taking next steps, he could potentially receive a large loan or financial gift from others, have a fire sale of properties, or declare bankruptcy. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, we will ask the judge to seize his assets. James has already filed judgments on Trump's Seven Springs estate and Trump National Golf Club in Westchester. She could also potentially move to acquire his 72-story skyscraper on Wall Street, or his Fifth Avenue Trump Tower. This crucial deadline coming the same day that Trump will be in New York for a hearing related to his pending criminal trial over his alleged scheme to cover up hush money payments to Stormy Daniels around the 2016 election. The judge is expected to set a trial start date during tomorrow's hearing. And on the road to the White House tonight, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump won Louisiana's primary, collecting more delegates after they already clinched their party nominations. Biden also appeared in Missouri's Democratic primary, with the results to be as expected. None of the races were in suspense. Biden and Trump have already beaten their major competitors. But the primary races are still closely watched by insiders for turnout and signs of protest voters. For Biden, some liberals are registering their anger with Israel's war against Hamas following the militant group's attack October 7th. Trump is his party's dominant figure and has locked up a third straight Republican nomination. But he faces dissent from people worried about the immense legal jeopardy he faces or critical of his White House term. Saturday's primary was Missouri's Democratic Party's first party-run presidential contest since a new law took in effect in August 2022. Louisiana's primaries, meanwhile, come almost four years after the state was the first to postpone its primaries due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As the election battle between Donald Trump and Joe Biden continues, there are growing fears around the health of the U.S. news media, which has been struck by job losses, declining circulations, the closure or crippling of well-known brands and rise of new threats such as the fake or AI-generated information on social media. And now on the South Korea doctor walkouts, Health Minister Cho Kyu Hong said the government is trying its best to engage in constructive talks with doctors as soon as possible. The announcement came as President Yoon suk yeol over the weekend ordered officials to be a bit more flexible before suspending the medical licenses of doctors who are taking part in the mass walkouts. Health Minister Cho Kyu Hong described on Monday the government's efforts to hold talks with the doctors. The government has immediately begun working towards establishing discussions with the medical community and will come up with a day for both sides to sit down for talks as soon as possible. Minister Cho added the government will come up with flexible measures to deal with health care absences caused by the walkouts and license suspensions of junior doctors who left the medical field. But he made it clear once again that the government's goal remains intact. 
We will certainly complete the goal of the expanding medical school admissions for the first time in 27 years. We ask for your support until the end. The health minister's announcement came as President Yoon suk yeol over the weekend ordered to flexibly handle the suspension of doctors taking part in the walkout. The president also ordered Prime Minister Han duk su to create a constructive council to push for dialogue with the medical professionals. There are mixed reactions from the medical community. The emergency committee of the country's top medical school, Seoul National University College of Medicine, released a statement saying it's a positive sign that the government has suggested creating a council for constructive discussion and asked for further review of the original plan to increase student numbers. But other professors, such as those from Korea University Medicine, submitted collective resignations on Monday opposing to the government plan to increase medical school student enrollment by 2000 next year. And now on the chaos in Haiti, grave diggers buried charred bodies allegedly belonging to gang members in the conflict-ridden country after clashes between the national police and armed groups left prominent gang leader El Siolme, also known as T. Greg, dead. Grave diggers buried charred bodies allegedly belonging to gang members in Haiti after clashes between the national police and armed groups left the prominent gang leader dead. Authorities were seen recovering the charred bodies from the street in Port-au-Prince on Friday. The remains were said to be members of the Delmas 95 gang led by Ernst Julme, also known as T. Greg. It was not clear if one of the charred bodies was Julme, who died in the shootout with police. The death of Julme, who is associated with crime boss Jimmy Barbecue Cherizier's alliance, marks a setback for the gangs and their effort to take over more of the city. Jomé had recently escaped from Haiti's largest prison in a mass jailbreak. Haiti has been gripped by violence since rival gangs unleashed a wave of attacks this month. Thousands have been killed and hundreds of thousands displaced. International organizations, including the World Food Program, said almost half of Haiti's people are struggling to feed themselves, with the country now suffering its worst level of food insecurity on record. Regional leaders are trying to form a transitional council that will be tasked with appointing a replacement for Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who announced his resignation on March 11th. He is currently stranded abroad as gang violence prevented his return to the country. And we have some more election updates from across the globe now. Early signs from Senegal's presidential vote put opposition leader Basiro Diome fire ahead, drawing his supporters to Dakar streets to celebrate. However, his main rival from the ruling coalition said a runoff will be needed to determine the winner. Millions took part in a peaceful day of voting to elect Senegal's fifth president. It followed three years of unprecedented political turbulence that sparked violent anti-government protests and buoyed support for the opposition. Many people are already celebrating. At least five of the nearly 20 candidates in the race have congratulated Faye as results are slowly trickling in. But former Prime Minister Amadou Ba, the ruling coalition's candidate, said that celebrations were premature. Voters decided on who will replace the outgoing president, Macky Sall, who is stepping down after a second term marred by unrest in one of West Africa's more stable democracies. The incumbent was not on the ballot for the first time in Senegal's history. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Here's an interesting story for you. Some of us may have certain hobbies that they've kept up with over the course of years. Some may even have just begun to appreciate having a hobby. Some come across as the most obvious, like coins, stamps or notes, or even books, like myself. Well, here's the story of one such devout collector. His object of passion? Hot Wheels. You never know when you're going to find your passion. But for Doug Woods of Toronto, it was at age four back in 1969. Well, my first uh, exposure to Hot Wheels was actually at a guard sale locally uh, with my dad. And um, I was uh, searching through the yard sale, looking through some boxes, and I found a rear loader beach bomb. Um, which was my first car at four years old, and I still have that car to today. 
and one car led to another and I just started accumulating and accumulating and uh, building my collection bit by bit. 43 years later, he has built up an impressive collection, which has spread to other parts of his life. He says Hot Wheels were used as favors for his wedding. His six-year-old daughter is now his partner in collecting. He even started a Hot Wheels collecting club. Wood says his next goal is to find a way to display his entire collection. Right now, I can't display it all. It's just uh, too vast a collection to display, but uh, I managed to get a few of my favorites up on the walls here and uh, approximately 25,000 pieces. That's track sets, cars, and accessories pertaining to Hot Wheels only. While he doesn't have enough for a Guinness World Record, he says that's okay. The experiences he's had through his hobby are enough of a reward. I think there are collectors that have more cars than I do. I just enjoy the hobby and uh, I've accumulated cars over the past uh, over 40 years of, um, of collecting. And I just enjoy uh, the cars, I enjoy the stories, I enjoy the ecosystem that is Hot Wheels collecting and the friends I've made along the way. And finally tonight, we saw a global initiative to bring focus on our climate. Landmarks in various cities, including London and Sydney, went dark as a symbolic gesture in support of the Global Earth R campaign. Paris, Sydney, Tokyo and Hong Kong also joined landmarks around the world in marking Earth Hour. The initiative coordinated by the conservation group Worldwide Fund for Nature or WWFN encourages iconic landmarks to power down for one hour, emphasizing the collective commitment to fostering a zero carbon lifestyle and sustainable development. Originating in Sydney all the way back in 2007, Earth Hour has evolved into a widespread movement spanning more than 180 countries and territories worldwide. Well, I'm not quite sure if I can tell you exactly how a lights out on key landmark can translate to a better climate. But hey, maybe they can shed some light on the problems through the darkness. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.